Good morning, church. My name is Darian. I'm the pastor here at Upward Call Church, and I want to say thank you for joining us this morning. I want to start off by reading Psalm chapter 24. And if you could flip there or tap there, uh, that would be great. You could read along. It says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. For he laid the foundation of the seas and built it on the ocean's depths. Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those whose hands are uh, hands and hearts are pure, who do not worship idols and never tell lies. They will receive the blessing of the Lord and have right relationship with God, their savior. Such people may seek you and worship you in your presence, O God of Jacob. Open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors, and let the King of glory enter. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord invincible in battle. Open up ancient gates and open up ancient doors and let the King of glory enter. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of heaven's armies. He is the King of glory. Let's worship him, this King of glory. Let's let him enter into our hearts, into our spaces, our homes, our lives. Let's worship God. You call yourself from the dead into your freedom. Our chains are gone. And no weapon form shall prevail. Your word is stronger. We overcome. Your glory resounds through the air, all saints declaring your great renown. Your kingdom forever will stand, we won't be shaken, we will not fear. And I got a mighty warrior, you're a consuming fire, be victory you reign. We triumph in your name, Jesus, the great commander. You conquered death forever, in victory you reign. We triumph in your name. Your glory resounds through the age, all saints declaring. Your great renown, your kingdom forever will stand. Oh, we won't be shaken, we will not fear. Yeah. I got a mighty warrior, you're a consuming fire. In victory you reign, we triumph in your name. Jesus, the great commander. You conquered death forever, in victory you reign, we triumph in your name. And we declare your name is power, exalted one, your name is higher. You stand alone, our strong defender, above you there's no other. Above you there's no other And we declare Your name is power Exalted one Your name is higher You stand alone A strong defender Above you there's no other 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 I got a mighty warrior You're a consuming fire In victory you reign We triumph in your name Jesus the great commander 
You conquer death forever in victory. We triumph in your name. I got a mighty warrior. You're a consuming fire in victory. You we triumph in your name. Jesus, a great commander. You conquer death forever in victory. We triumph in your name. In victory you reign, we triumph in your name.
Church, when we usher in the presence of God and we let the King of glory enter into our lives, then we become partners with the King to see his kingdom advance, not just out in the world, but in our own very hearts, in our own lives, in our families' lives. That's what it's about. It has to start here before it goes there. Hopefully you entered into that place in the worship as we gave our hearts to the King. We're gonna take two minutes just to break. Come on back and we'll get into the word. Thanks for joining us for Church Online. Here at Upward Call, we're all about Jesus and building community with one another. We would love to pray for you and keep you updated with the latest. Head to upwardcall.church forward slash connect to fill out an online connect card. There you can update your contact information and let us know how we can pray for you. Now, here's what's coming up this week at Upward Call. We have three online connect times happening this week. The ladies kick it off with a midweek Bible study this Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Men, this Saturday, grab a fresh cup of joe and log in for a morning devotional. Starts at 8 a.m. We believe in the power of prayer and we would love to pray for you. Be sure to fill out a connect card with any prayer request and join us this Thursday at 7.30 p.m. for our online prayer night. Online events are hosted on the Zoom conference app. Download Zoom on mobile or desktop, create an account, and join in with the meeting ID 383-114-6621. Please feel free to contact us for assistance to set up your Zoom account. There are three ways to give your tithes and offerings. You can mail a check to 4863 Philadelphia Street, Chino, California, 91710, or you can text the word GIVE to 951-330-3618 and follow the instructions to set up your text to give account. You can also give online at upwardcall.church forward slash give and click on the Give tab. Feel free to contact us for assistance. That is all for announcements. 
Now here's the message of the week. I often say that anyone who comes up to preach should have something to say. There should be something that God has put on their hearts. And this morning, I've asked someone to minister who has something to say. I've asked Jessica Tubergen to, to bring the word this morning because I've, I've heard what she's actually had to say. I listened to her preach this. And I think this is a, a moment for us to grab hold of what God is saying, to hear the voice of God and the tender heart of God. Now, you know, I don't believe in discrimination. I don't believe in ageism, sexism, colorism. I believe that if God has put something in your heart to speak, then you should speak. And if he's put something in someone's heart to speak, then we should listen. So this morning, let's listen. Good morning, church. Um, it's such a privilege to be speaking with you this morning. I wish that it was in person, but we're going on seven months of this and we are doing the very best that we can, making the most of it, but know that my heart was to be with you guys in person. So I'm pretending that that is what's happening right now. Um, Darian asked me to share a word that I had shared last week when I was at the retreat um, up in Lake Tahoe. And it's actually a word that I remembered as I was preparing today that I felt like the Lord gave me back in March before, like right before COVID hit, I was supposed to preach. And so I just think it's really cool, just the timing of God. Like I really do believe that this is a word for us now individually, um, and then the individual words that flow into the life of the church. Um, so today we're gonna be diving into John 15. Um, I feel like it's kind of a common passage, but I believe it's a word for us now. And it's easy to kind of skip over things that we think that we know and understand, but I really would like to encourage us just to open our hearts to hear him, to receive what it is that he has to say to us today. Um, so today we're gonna to be talking about abiding in Christ and why we must abide in him, what hinders us from abiding in him, and then what also helps us in abiding in Christ. So my prayer today um, is that we would leave with a greater desire to be with Jesus. Um, so with that, let's just open with prayer. I know that we probably prayed already like six times this morning, but just join me in prayer. Father God, I just thank you for who you are, that you are here in this place, God. That even if we can't meet together, that you meet with us, that you are here present. And I pray that you would just speak, God, that you would speak words of life over your people, and that you would bring encouragement. You would even speak prophetically, God, just a hope and a vision for the future. God, I thank you that who we were yesterday doesn't have to be who we are today, and that you are the miracle working God and that miracles are often done in us, changing our hearts, changing our minds, changing our lives. So we set our eyes on you today, God, and we just trust you. We trust you to speak, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're jumping in. We're gonna read John 15. I'm gonna be reading from the Passion Translation. Um, it says, I am a true sprouting vine, and the farmer who tends to the vine is my father. He cares for the branches connected to me by lifting and propping up the fruitless branches and pruning every fruitful branch to yield a greater harvest. The words I have spoken over you, you have already, have already cleansed you. So you must remain in life union with me, for I remain in life union with you. For as a branch severed from the vine will not bear fruit, so your life will be fruitless unless you live your life intimately joined to mine. I am the sprouting vine, and you're my branches. As you live in union with me as your source, fruitfulness will stream from within you. But when you live separated from me, you are powerless. If a person is separated from me, he is discarded. Such branches are gathered up and thrown into the fire to be burned. But if you live in life union with me, and if my words live powerfully within you, then you can ask whatever you desire and it will be done. When your lives bear abundant fruit, you demonstrate that you are my mature disciples who glorify my Father. I love each of you with the same love that the Father loves me. You must continually let my love nourish your hearts. If you keep my commands, you will live in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and continue, for I continually live nourished and empowered by his love. My purpose for telling you these things is so that the joy that I experience will fill your hearts with overflowing gladness. 
How beautiful is that scripture? Um, again, like I said, sometimes I feel like we read over things and kind of gloss over it, but those were Jesus's words to his disciples. Like those are Jesus's words to us. Just amazing. Um, I feel like I could spend hours on that, but I won't. Um, all that to say from the John, we're gonna, John 15, we're gonna pull out different pieces and parts of it. Uh, so stick with me. Um, but the overarching theme that I feel like as I read through that is just, we're called to live a fruitful life right? Like God's desire for us is to live in fruit, that we would multiply, that there would be increase and impact and influence in greater measures. He's a God of multiplication. Um, so in John 15, we see that this only comes through intimate relationship with Jesus. I feel like we just get it so backwards sometimes. Like we constantly focus on the fruit, right? Which is a byproduct of relationship with him rather than focusing on just our relationship with God. One of um, my good friends says all of the time, like, make your life about Jesus and your ministry will follow. If we make our life about Jesus and we're deeply rooted and grounded in him and living in union with him, the fruit will come. Like, it's a natural overflow and byproducts. Like, apple trees don't have to think about producing apples. Like, they just do. And so for living in union with Jesus every day, that deep abiding union in him, Fruit is going to be the natural overflow. So we can stop worrying and striving and trying to like reach and grasp after fruit. Let's just take a step back and just sit and be with Jesus. Not that there isn't work to be done and all of that there is, but let's rest in him. Be deeply rooted, like joined in intimate relationship with God. The fruit comes from that place. Um, So as some of you may know, I love words. I think I say that all the time. I don't usually say a lot until I get into settings like this maybe or one-on-one conversations, but I love words and definitions and just the pictures that they paint. And I think it's so beautiful in scripture to see, like to really dig in to the words in the original language. And so we're going to do a little bit of that this morning just with the word abide. Um, In Greek, the word is meno, um, and it means to stay in a given place, state, relation, or expectancy. Abide means continue, dwell, endure, be present, remain, stand. Reading over those definitions, they're just settling words. Like as I read it, I'm like, okay, like I feel like I can just take deep breaths and deep breaths, like abide and continue, dwell, be present. And that's the one that really stuck out to me as I was reading it, that we are meant to be present in him present in our relationship with him, um, continuously finding all that we need in him. Just be present with him. It's so easy in our culture to be distracted by so many other things and like on to the next best thing. Like there is nothing better than Jesus. <laughs> so let's just be present in him and be present in our relationship with him in the good and the bad and the highs and the lows. Like be present in it. That we would make our home in him. And I was thinking about this, like what a home is meant to be. It's meant to be a place of safety and rest and refuge, right? Where you can feel free to be yourself completely, like without judgment, that you are completely relaxed. Like let's make our home in him. He is that for us. He is our safe place. He is our refuge. Like why wouldn't we want to abide and dwell and remain and be present in that place? Um, Jesus is our source. He is not a resource. I'm going to say that again in case you didn't catch it. Jesus is our source. He is not a resource. He is not something or someone that we go to when we have nothing and no one else. He is not our safety net. He is our source, our source of life. He is our very life. Like I said before, we don't live our lives in pursuit of fruit. Right? We live our lives in pursuit of Jesus. Fruit is the byproduct, right? Fruit is the byproduct of pursuing Jesus and a life spent with him. And I also think this is just key. Like perfection is not the goal. And I feel like we say it often and we probably hear it often, but do we live it? Do we really truly believe that that is not our goal? We're not striving for perfection. We're striving to know Jesus more right? That is our pursuit in life. And abiding is learning to rest in his perfection. The work is already done. 
Friend, the work is already done. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. When he um, died on the cross, gave up his life for us, he said, it is finished. It is done, complete, finished work. There is nothing that we can add to the work on the cross, nothing for us to take away from it. So why are we striving? We can just rest, rest in the finished work. Rest in the fact that he has made us alive in him. In him, we are complete. Again, if we're living and abiding in the vine, he is our life source. We're complete in that. We need nothing else outside of him. The work is done. We are his. Like I said, he is seated at the the right hand of the throne of God. He is not worried about the state of this world or of this life like we can be, especially in, in the world and in, in this year, in this time, with all of the challenges and all of the unknowns. God is not taken off guard. He knows. And it's not that he doesn't care, because he, he does care. He sees and he knows. He's with us. His heart breaks um, with us, and he weeps. He mourns with those who mourn, but he's not taken off guard. God has been God a long time. He is sovereign over all and he is in control. And thinking about that truth, like imagine how different our lives would be if we actually believed this and lived it. Not just a thought in our head like, oh yeah, that is true. But if it is deep in our hearts that this is true, that God is on the throne, that he is in control, it would change everything. And that's where Jesus wants us to live. That's the whole purpose of this life and relationship is to live in that like surrendered state to him, knowing that he is in control, that we would abide and remain, that it wouldn't be a place that we visit every now and then or on Sunday mornings or just when we need something like going to him as a resource, right? Which we can do. We do go, go to God when we need something, but that can be the only time. Like he wants, he wants our hearts Um, surrendered and submitted to him. So it's not even about striving to enter rest, right? Because I hear this, I'm like, okay, now I need to do like all the things and check off all of the things on my list in order to enter rest. But striving and rest can't even coexist. Like they don't fit in the same sentence, the same vocabulary. Like we're not striving to enter the rest. Like it's already done and we can enter in freely. Um, It's not about working to earn a position of rest with him. Like, that is done. I think I said it enough times. Like, it is finished. The work is done, and we can settle in that. Um, In him, all things hold together. In him, not in me, not in you. Like, the weight of the world doesn't fall on our shoulders. In him, all things hold together. He is before all things. And in him, we live and move and have our being. That is the way that it's supposed to be, that we would be so deeply, intimately connected with the Father that in him, we live and move and have our being. He is our very breath. He is our life. That this would be like revelation for us, is my prayer, that it would change the way that we live. Like it's not just information, right, that we know in our head, but actually revelation that then bring transformation in our life that it moves from our heads to our hearts, the truth of who God is, who we are in him, like that that would burn deep in our hearts and from there like flow rivers of living water, right? It's from that place of deep intimacy with God that fruit comes. When we stop living for our glory and our desires and our dreams or even living from our fear and our disappointment like in our pain, but when he has wooed our hearts and when he has our yes, no matter what it looks like, when he has our yes, when we surrender to him and the surrender that only comes from knowing his nature and his character, from trusting him, right? Surrender comes from that place. Once we surrender, there's freedom. There's freedom on the other side of surrender. And once we reach that point, we're swept up into this current of his anointing. And I think anointing is thrown around a lot and it's like, I don't know what that really means and what it is, but basically it's just simply the God-given ability to get the job done. Like each person 
first, our first goal is to know Jesus and to make him known, to be disciples of him. And then from that, there's also giftings that he's given us and a purpose and a plan for our life. And so when we finally get to the point where we surrender what we think we want and what we think we need, when he has our heart and he has our yes, there's just like from the place of abiding in relationship with him, we're swept up into this river of his anointing and just flowing in a river of his grace, like where it's just us and Jesus, right? Like it sounds weird and like, it's not, (laughs) it's biblical. Obviously like there are banks, always banks to the river and God keeps us on track, but that's where we're made for something so much bigger than what we can see. And that's just what he wants. He just wants our yes. He wants our heart. And as you can see, like it's always him working in us. He is the one that is working in us. He is our source of life. And apart from him, we have no good thing. I think of value. How often do we look somewhere else to find things that will give us life? Even like immediate like um, satisfaction, right? Like we're all about like the right now, right here, right now. But nothing apart from Jesus is going to satisfy ever, ever. Nothing will ever satisfy. And he has given us everything that we need for life and godliness. That's 2 Peter 1, 3. He will not give us what we need apart from himself because there is nothing outside of him that we need. Like he is the one who satisfies our every desire, every need. Because of him, we lack nothing. Again, we are made complete in him. He holds all things. We were created to live in a dependent relationship with Jesus. Like to live in that place. That it wouldn't be, again, just a moment of visiting. That it's not just the moment of salvation, but every moment after. We get saved and then we daily come to the throne room in need of his grace and his strength. Zechariah 4, 6 says this, Not by might nor by power, but by his spirit. Again, what if we lived that truth that is not about what I can muster up and what I can do in my own strength? It's not about my own power, but it's by his spirit, by the power of God. Another excellent verse, um, one of my favorites, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Again, reading from the Passion Translation. It says, but he, an- he answered me, my grace is always more than enough for you, and my power finds its full expression through your weakness. So I will celebrate my weaknesses, for when I am weak, I sense more deeply the mighty power of Christ living in me. So I'm not defeated by my weakness, but delighted. For when I feel my weakness and endure mistreatment, when I am surrounded with troubles on every side and face persecution because of my love for Christ, I am made yet stronger. For my weakness becomes a portal to God's power. I read that version and I was like, just blown away. Like, okay, so I'm not defeated by my weakness, but delighted. It so goes against everything in our culture where I feel like we try to cover up our weaknesses and hide our imperfections. When it's actually living in Christ, our weaknesses are made strengths because of him, because of his power. Like, what if we live this? Do we believe that? Like, or are we always trying to cover and hide our weaknesses? there's a better way. Like our weaknesses can become a portal to God's power. And this isn't about the power of positive self-talk, right? I think there is a place for affirmation and speaking truth over our hearts and over our lives, but that's not what this is. Like we can't talk ourselves into living in a place of power. Like we have none. Apart from him, we have nothing. This is about living in the power of the living God. He is our source, our source of strength, our source of power, our source of life. It only comes from abiding in him. We can do nothing. You can do nothing. I can do nothing without him. We need his grace. We need his strength. So back in March of 2018, Um, I prayed this prayer, and I don't even know where it came from, really, or why I decided that this would be a good idea. Um, But I feel like it was one of of those moments with the Lord where, like, everything just seems right with the world. (laughs) And you're like, Jesus can do anything. Like, this is great. And you're just living in that 
state of bliss almost. Um, so I prayed this prayer. I said, God, would you give me a greater revelation of my humanity? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Again, I don't know. But I prayed that prayer and then honestly forgot about it um, for about nine months. And in that season, I honestly went through like one of the darkest times of my life. And then by the God, by God's grace and his kindness and his goodness, like pointed it out to me, like that I prayed this prayer and then nine months of my life, that was just like, what is happening? I look back and I see like, that was my humanity. <laughs> like without Christ, I am broken. <laughs> like I am so desperate for him, like every moment and every day. And like, no, I don't believe that the Lord like made me walk through that season or that he like caused things to happen, but he definitely allowed them. And from that prayer that I forgot that I prayed, like, but it was something that I desperately needed to be more aware of who God is and like how he is the vine. He is my source. He is life to me. Like apart from him, I really can do nothing. Um, yeah, just living disconnected from him in a way that I never want to experience again. And the Lord reminded me of that prayer that I prayed. I think it was about nine months after I prayed it. And I was laying on the beach in Newport. And it had been a while since I'd been there. And it's always just a place that the Lord speaks to me and encourages me and speaks life over me. And kind of out of the blue, like I was just laying there and I felt like the Lord just said to me, like, you never have to know darkness like that again. And again, like he didn't cause me to walk through that season, but I prayed that prayer and now I'm like more aware of who I am without him and my dependence on him. Like each of us are made for relationship with God. Like he is our source. He is our life. And so I share that just to say, <laughs> be careful what you pray. No, but to say like, again, we need him. Like we are nothing without him. And that is beautiful. And it's not something to cover up or be ashamed of, but it's actually how he made us to live in relationship with him. Um, so as we wrap up, I just kind of want to go over some of the things that hinder us from abiding in God, right? Because this just seems like this is easy. Like, why are we not doing this? Why are we not living every day abiding deeply in Jesus? There's like things that are hindrances for us. And so I want to talk about those things and then kind of go into some of the things that we can do to remove those hindrances and those barriers to actually live in relationship with Jesus. So what hinders us? What keeps us from living a fruitful life? What keeps us from abiding in Jesus? Um, I just thought of three kind of simple things, um, simple but difficult things, <laughs> um, that disappointment keeps us from living a fruitful life that keeps us from abiding in Jesus. I think there's so much misunderstood in what this Christian life is and expectations maybe that we put on God that are not biblical or not true, that are not truth. And so we live in this place of being disappointed or frustrated with God or I don't know, there's those things that keep us from relationship with him, right? That Or fear that we are afraid that we can't trust him. But again, we go back to the knowledge of who God is, knowing his nature, knowing his character, knowing that he is always good. Like those things automatically tear down those walls of disappointment. But number one, disappointments keep us from abiding in him. Also distractions. Maybe I'm the only one, but I feel like this world is just full of distractions that we're constantly like looking all over the place, trying to find, like I said, the next best thing. There's always distractions that keep us from living a fruitful life, keep us from abiding in Jesus. And also disobedience, not something that people really want to talk about a lot of time, but it's real. Like we are servants of Christ. Like our life is not our own. We are meant to live fully submitted to God, like because he is God and he knows best. So when he asks us to do things, to lay down our life and follow him, like we say yes to him right? From a place of, of love and surrender and knowing who he is, but then the things that hinder us from living in obedience to him, um, sorry, living from the things that keep us from abiding in Jesus, there's disobedience. Like when we don't listen to what he said, it leads us into shame or into guilt and feeling disconnected from him that we try to hide from him, which 
silly because he sees all things and he knows all things, but it's real. Like, so disobedience keeps us from abiding in him. Um, I found a lot of times that it's a battle of our minds, right? We have to fight to believe his words above how I feel, that we have to believe the word of God above what I see, that we choose to focus on what he has said and not the other voices constantly vying for our attention. Uh, there's a voices like of our insecurities, right? The enemy coming against us. Other people's words or perceptions or expectations over our lives. Like, and these can be both people like currently in our life or as well as those who have been spoken death over our life in the past. Like, there's life and death in the tongue, right? And the words are powerful. And so are we listening to voices that people are speaking over our lives now or from years ago? And um, there's also the voice of the world. So much noise happening all of the time. And even those that we love, like people speaking maybe good things over us, but it's not actually truth and not actually beneficial or what the Lord is saying. So there's constantly all of those voices that we need to learn to shut everything else out and hear his voice in order to abide, right? <laughs> like focus on the Lord, that we would not be distracted, that we would not choose to live in disobedience, that we would not be disappointed, but that we would set our eyes on him knowing that he is good. We have to pursue his voice because his words are life. Um, I often think about with this, like just the different voices and the distractions. I think of like sheep that are just in the pasture wandering and We've all heard it. Like we're called sheep in the Bible, right? Like he is the good shepherd and sheep are dumb a lot of times and we just, we're out here. And so we start like following this little patch of grass thinking that it looks good. And before we know it, we're like far off from the rest of the flock. And you look up and you're like, how did I end up here? And there's just the like small distractions, right? That pull us away. And then once we get into a point of isolation, that's when the, the enemy and like the wolves will come and attack the sheep. So there's just like such a need to stay in community. First, staying in intimate relationship with the Lord. If you're staying close to the shepherd and you know his voice and you're drowning out the voice of everything else and everyone else, that you can hear him speak life and truth over you and you're living in that place of intimate relationship with God, like you're not gonna wander off to be by yourself. Like near him is better. There's no better place that you could be. So it speaks to like living in community with first with God, right? Intimate relationship with him and then also community with others. Like we're not meant to live on our own. That's why I think like this year has been so hard because there has been so much isolation. Um, but don't be like that sheep. Don't like follow the patch of grass and the, like the next patch of grass and then look up and realize that you're on your own. Like we are made to live in a relationship with one another. Um, we need each other to speak truth, right? When all we hear are the lies or when we look up and all we see is just darkness all around. Like we need each other. So I would encourage you uh, to be that for one another, right? That we want to speak life over, over our community, over the people that God has given into our flock. Um, and also speaks to this, that the enemy doesn't have to destroy us, right? But he just has to distract us. He distracts us with a little patch of grass and we start like nibbling that and like following the next one and the next one. And before we know it, we're on our own. Don't allow that to happen. We need to, we need to learn to fight these things, right? All the things that I said will hinder our relationship with God and hinder our, um, the ability to abide in him, the disappointment, um, disobedience. There was another D word distractions. <laughs> um, we need to combat those things. So how? How do we combat them? We combat them with truth. We have to know the word of God, that we are continually turning our eyes to him, setting our minds on truth and allowing his love to nourish our hearts. That's what it says in John 15, verse nine and 10. It says, I love each of you with the same love that the father loves me. You must continually let my, word, let my love nourish your hearts. If you keep my commands, you will live in my love just as I have kept my father's commands. For I continually live nourished and empowered by his love. If Jesus did that, like we also have to do that, right? He lives nourished by God's love and empowered by his love. So we combat these things with truth, continually setting our eyes on Jesus. We combat the hindrances by living in obedience, 
right? Do the opposite. If there's like, you're wanting to live in disobedience, rest in the father, ask for his power and his grace that we would live in obedience to him. We also set our minds on things above. Colossians 3, 1 through 4, this is the New Living Translation. It says, since you have been raised to a new life with Christ, set your sight on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about things of heaven, not on the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Amazing. <laughs> like, it seems so simple, but it's not easy, right? Like, we have to set our minds continuously, like, moment after moment, hour after hour, day after day, that we are setting our minds on Christ. Because we have died, like Colossians 3, 1 through 4 says, you died to this life. And our real life is hidden with Christ and God. That is where our real life is. So how are we combating these things? We are setting our minds on things above. We are living in obedience, knowing the truth, and also we allow pruning. Um, I'm just going to touch on this just a little bit. In John 15, it talks about how um, the vine dresser like prunes vines, right? And he prunes it in order that they would bear more fruit. And I feel like I constantly am thinking like, or at least growing up, that I've always seen pruning as a bad thing, but actually pruning is for our good, right? It produces a greater harvest. And that is the desire of Jesus for our lives, that we would, pers- that we would produce fruit. So pruning is not for the purpose of pain, but there is purpose in pruning. (laughs) And the purpose of pruning is that we would produce fruit. So allow the pruning. It's not always, it's never comfortable. (laughs) It's never easy, but it is for our good. And God does know better. Um, What he says is good for us is really good for us. And so we can trust him in that. Allow the pruning to come. And then also choose to believe his words. Because every word that comes from the mouth of God is true. Every single word. There are so many things in this world that keep us and try to keep us from abiding in Jesus. We have to fight to live in intimacy with him. And it's not for what we can get from him, but simply to live in the fruit of relationship. He is all of that we need. John 15 verse 4, it says, When you live lives... Sorry, when your lives bear abundant fruit, you demonstrate that you are my mature disciples who glorify my Father. That is evidence that we are disciples of Jesus, that our lives bear fruit. And again, we're not pursuing the fruit, we pursue Jesus. Pursue Jesus, run after him with your life. Fruit is the evidence that we are mature mature disciples. And we never grow past this stage of dependence on Jesus. It's not like, okay, once you've been saved for... 10 years, 15 years, that, okay, you're done. No, this is forever, that we pursue Jesus with our lives, that we live in deep relationship with him, that wholeness and freedom and joy forevermore comes. Um, John 15, 11 says this in the Amplified. He said, I have told you these things so that my joy and delight may be in you and that your joy may be made full and complete and overflowing. That is the desire of the Father. That is the whole reason why. Like, he made us to live in intimate relationship with him for the purpose of living in relationship with him, for freedom and for wholeness and for fruitfulness, that the joy that is in him would also be in us, that our joy is made full. It's not found outside of him. So we have to fight to keep the one thing, being Jesus, the main thing, that our eyes are continuously on him, like a sunflower in the field, like facing the sun. We have to fight to maintain our unity with the Father and fiercely protect your relationship with him. And as I was preparing today, I just felt like the Lord said, like he's calling his children back home, that there is a returning back to him, um, that maybe at one stage you've lived in that place of abiding and resting and remaining and staying, like making your home in him, but that's no longer true for your life. And I felt like he just said that he's calling you back that it's not too late, (laughs) it's not too late that you can come back home to him, that he wants that deep relationship for you to live in a relationship with him that will produce fruits. So I just wanna pray uh, to close this out. Father God, we thank you that you are a source of life. God, I just pray right now that each person listening, God, if there needs to be a returning back to you, that we would surrender our hearts. God, that you would reveal yourself, make yourself known. 
um, that you would speak with with grace and with kindness but with strength as well that we would hear your voice and be willing to respond i thank you father that you are a source of life that apart from you we can do nothing apart from you we have no good thing may this word just settle into our hearts that it would fall on good soil that it would bear fruit and the best fruit of all that we would live in intimate relationship with you I thank you, God, that we are complete, lacking nothing in you. God, we give you all of the glory and all of the praise. In Jesus' name, amen.